The reading this morning is from Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 24. The Apostle Paul is addressing the Athenians, and he says this, verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. The God of life must have looked down with disgust and disdain on this date, January 22nd, 1973, 44 years ago, when the nation that claimed as its motto, the United States of America claimed in God we trust as its motto, its Supreme Court legalized the killing of innocent little babies within a mother's womb. The precious innocent little baby that you see behind me, just a little time before this, could be slaughtered in the mother's womb. Limbs torn apart, or gaseous fumes might burn the baby alive, but all protected by law. I do not know of a more heinous crime that could be committed in the sight of God than the taking of innocent human life. I am fully convinced that this is an issue that I will be fighting and so will you for the rest of our days here on this earth. And it is very, very important that we understand what's at stake. And since this particular issue involves the political process, we better make sure that the sanctity of human life is something that we hold dear to our hearts and that we will hold politicians accountable. For in this decision, the Supreme Court of the United States is primarily to blame. My prayer is presently that we will have in the near future more and more added to the Supreme Court and the lower courts who respect the sanctity of human life. But politicians are also responsible who because of their thirst for power are willing to confirm judges to the various courts that do not respect what is foundational in our country, the right to life. Christians who pay very little attention to this issue and refuse to speak up for the little babies, likewise bear part of the blame. Those Christians who help elect those politicians that confirm 
those judges are partly to blame. Likewise, organizations like Planned Parenthood are to blame. Organizations that hide behind the mask of doing something good for women. But in reality, they're nothing more than baby-killing organizations. You listen today to Cecile Richards, who is the president of Planned Parenthood, the daughter of an obnoxious and outspoken former governor of Texas, Ann Richards. You listen to Cecile Richards and you would think that, that she cares so much for women and for children. And that's what Planned Parenthood, she says, is all about. But their primary focus is abortion, and that can be proved. For it was founded by a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger about 100 years ago. Margaret Sanger was a racist. In fact, she was, she was a woman who was determined, like Hitler and others, to create a superior race. And so Margaret Sanger is the founder of this organization, a eugenicist, superiority of the races, a woman who actually said that the most merciful thing a large family could ever do to one of its members is kill it. And today this, this woman full of racism a woman who was trying to create a superior race, she is lifted up as the icon of the feminist movement. Isn't that interesting? Margaret Sanger. I'll tell you who else is responsible for this, this murder of unborn babies. The doctors who will perform abortions because of their greed their love of money. They build their houses with the bones and the blood of little babies. The bones and the blood, the bricks and the mortar for their houses. And then mothers and fathers who through misinformation ignorance or selfishness determine that they will terminate the life of the child inside the womb. They too bear a responsibility for this. What has happened in a society that has grown so calloused that it has no regard for the weakest, the most innocent among us. Well, I'll tell you this. I know who's behind it all. It is the one who's always behind death and destruction. The devil has to laugh and be pleased when courts make decisions like the Supreme Court made with Roe versus Wade. Because you see, Jesus identified the devil as a murderer. He is the one who loves the idea of death. He enjoyed seeing Job's family destroyed. That's his delight. But I will say this about the God of heaven. He's a God of light. And in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, he made it clear, thou shalt not kill, that is, thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not take the life of the innocent. Furthermore, in Proverbs 6, 
we read of those things that God hates. And among those things that God hates, verse 17 of that chapter, hands that shed innocent blood. How then did all this get started? I believe one primary reason is evolutionary thinking. When consistently it is taught that man came from lower forms of life instead of made in the image of God, we shouldn't be surprised why that our citizens really do not have a problem with abortion. In fact, you look in our society today and it seems nothing for one person to take the life of another. Our cities are filled with this kind of violence. And so evolutionary thinking says that man came from lower forms of life. And though the evolutionist doesn't like to say it, we'll go ahead and say it because it's true. What they are saying is that man is just really that which came from the animal king. He's an animal. He's an animal. Can't help himself. And there have been those down through the centuries who have promoted the idea of a superior race, crush the weak, and in the last 150 years or so, in this country and throughout the world, the religion of Darwin has had a major impact on the thinking of many. There was a dark, depressed philosopher by the name of Nietzsche. He loved to study Darwin. By the way, if you study the teachings of Darwin, you can't help but be depressed. Hitler loved studying Nietzsche. And we learned something from that. It doesn't take one very long, a society very long, from going from Darwin to Nietzsche to the gas ovens of Hitler to the abortion mills in America today. And so as Christians, we need to stand for human life because the God of heaven is the author of human life. And biblically, we can make this clear to all those around us. Oh, I understand there are a lot of people who don't respect the Bible. I accept that. But we do. And we're going to keep preaching and teaching the Bible. And I know what the psalmist had to say about God, the God of life, and his relationship with the unborn. In Psalm 139, David says, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. Where did the beginning take place for the child? Inside the womb. The psalmist says, You know, you know me from the time I was in my womb. Oh God. And there I was made. I was made. The making of the child didn't take place outside of the womb. It was in the womb. Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah identifies that he was called a prophet. He identifies himself as a prophet. And it's, it, it, it's a calling that took place even while he was in the womb. And so life does not begin at birth. Life begins at conception. You think about it just for a moment. You godly mothers in this room who, who desired to have children, you and your husband looked at a sonogram and you saw the movement inside the womb and it excited you. You didn't say, look at that glob of tissue. You didn't say, look at that fetus. You say, look at my baby. Well, godly mothers, even today, want everybody to know 
what's going on during the time of their pregnancy. In fact, we see the pictures of the little one. Look at my baby. Godly mothers and fathers are already in love with that baby. Do not want any harm whatsoever to come to that baby. I want you to notice something else. In Luke chapter 1, Mary has been given the good news that she's going to bring Jesus into this world and he will save his people from their sins. Six months before that, her cousin Elizabeth found out that she also was with child. That child, we, knew, we know, grew to be John the Baptist. And so it is in, in the opening chapter of Luke, in verse 41, when Mary comes to visit with Elizabeth to share this good news the text says, it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. The word for babe there is brephos. Is that a special kind of word to refer to a glob of tissue inside the mother? Is that a special kind of word that refers to a fetus? to something that's really not alive yet? Well, all I know is this. In John 2, verse 12, we read, or rather Luke 2, verse 12, we read, This shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Now that speaks of Jesus, doesn't it? Who's already been born. And did you know the same word, brephos, refers to the baby Jesus? as it refers to the babe in Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist. God says that a little baby that you hold in your arms is the same as that which was in the womb. A baby in the womb, a baby outside the womb. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, medical doctor on the faculty of Princeton, performed some 60,000 abortions during his life. But then he reached a point where he just stopped. He stopped. Why, Dr. Nathanson, did you, did you stop aborting children. He said, I am deeply troubled by my own increasing certainty that what I have done is presided over 60,000 deaths. He came to the realization, because he was honest, that what he was doing was taking innocent human life. Some years ago, Dr. Bernard Nathanson narrated a short film called The Silent Scream. It takes some courage to watch it. It's not easy to watch. It allows you to see inside the womb a 12-week-old baby. And in that particular presentation, as one looks inside the womb, as that little baby is being torn apart by the abortionist, before the life is taken, the little baby's mouth opens in what is called a silent scream. On your way out today, you can notice my lapel, baby's feet inside the womb. You'll notice that they look just like little baby's feet. It is an exact representation of such inside the womb at a very early stage, but already formed. All that has to happen is the little child has 
to grow. But everything's in place. Even the little feet have been formed. Now I'm appalled, and I know you are, that a little baby's life could be snuffed out at any point during a woman's pregnancy. But you think about this, friends. There are those who vigorously fight today for one of the most barbaric procedures that could ever be known, partial birth abortion. While the little baby is in the birth canal, the life can still be taken. Because of the dignity of this pulpit and because of the young people in this room today, I'm not going to go into a description of that. But my friends, it is atrocious and abominable. People say, well, we just don't know. We just don't know whether or not what's inside the womb is living or not. President Reagan used to say, well, if we don't know, wouldn't it be better to come down on the side of life? <laughs> Let's say for just a moment, we don't know and we can know. We do know. But let's say we can't know. Wouldn't it be better to come down on the side of life? For example, what if someone went out to a shooting range and someone said, now behind the target, there is someone standing, but that person shoots anyway and kills the person behind the, the target. Is he guilty of murder? Oh yes, he knew. But what if he stands there and and somebody happens to be back there, it shouldn't be back there, and he doesn't know anything about it, but he shoots and somebody dies. No, he didn't know that. He didn't know that someone was back there. But what if somebody says, there could be somebody back there, and he goes ahead and shoots. He's responsible then, isn't he? Yes. So somebody said, we just don't know. Shouldn't we come down on the side of life? Tell you something else President Reagan said, and he was right. Have you noticed that everybody that's for abortion has already been born? <laughs> yeah, interesting. All those who think abortion is all right, they've already been born. We have to be vigilant in our fight for the unborn because their voices cannot be heard, can they? We dare not become too comfortable with laws that have been passed that are intended to destroy the lives of the innocent. Yesterday in Washington, D.C., there was this big march. Half the ones there probably didn't know what they were marching against. They just knew to show up. And there they were in their march yesterday, yelling all kinds of obscenities. Madonna even said she's thought about blowing up the White House. Well, she needs to be in jail. And then uh, all kinds of, of placards, indecent things going on. All for the rights of women. But you know what was the core of that march? The rights of women to kill their offspring. And half the offspring is going to be female. Now you tell me how that supports the rights of women. I want to tell you, we're living in a sickening society in many ways. And we have a lying, scheming media that will not help us. They will not. This coming Friday, 
there is going to be a march for life where right-thinking people, people who respect God and who respect life, will gather in Washington, hundreds of thousands of them, with not one word from the media. It will be overlooked because of their left-wing bias. I'll tell you something, friends. We need to join the ranks of those who start holding this news media accountable. They are not on the side of Christianity. They are not on the side of God. Here's how it works. Last week, before he took office, the president-elect nominated the former governor of Georgia, former Governor Purdue, to be the Secretary of Agriculture. Of course, immediately the media went to work seeing what they could do to disavow Mr. Purdue and to degrade him in any way. They smirked and mocked Mr. Purdue. You know what the reason was? Why one time during a drought in Georgia, he called on everybody to pray. That's your ungodly, atheistic media. And we need to be fighting them as much as anybody. And don't you forget in this battle that there's a militancy to Christianity. First century Christians, they fought for what was right. And so must we. But what concerns me is the good, sincere people, and I believe they are good, sincere people, who for whatever reason just cannot understand this issue. And when you start talking about it, they get defensive and they say something like this, well, what about the little children already born? Well, we're concerned about little children already born. But could you help me understand how that justifies killing the baby in the womb? Well, they're poor children today and they're abused children today. All right then, well, let's just, let's just uh, go ahead and take their lives. Why don't we do that? No. <laughs> but you're all right with taking the lives of the ones in the mother's womb. A woman went to her doctor one day. She said to her OBGYN, she said, I'm going to have another baby. And she says, I already have one that's just a year old. You know that. She said, so I'm here to terminate the pregnancy. I just cannot be responsible for two children. So I want to terminate the pregnancy. The doctor thought just a minute. The doctor says, I think I have something better in mind. And she smiled and she thought, hey, the doctor's going to really help me out here. He said, here's what I'm proposing. Why don't we just go ahead and kill the child in your arms right now? It will be a lot safer for you, you see, than having an abortion. And not only that, since you will not have to care for that child any longer, then, then you'll be able to rest and get ready for this next one. You know what she said, don't you? No. You can't, you can't kill my child, my baby. Doctor said, and I'm not going to do it. Wouldn't dare. I'd be guilty of murder. Likewise, he says, I can't kill that little baby in your womb. It's that simple, friends. For someone to say, well, personally I'm opposed to it, but I, 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 can't, I can't make that decision for all others. What if somebody said, personally I'm opposed to slavery, enslaving a man? 
But you know, that's just my personal opinion. I, I wouldn't do it, but I can't stop others from doing that. And yet, we use the same reasoning, don't we, with the little ones in the womb. Well, personally, I'm opposed to it. No, you haven't figured out just yet, for whatever reason, that that which is in the womb is alive, created in the image of God with a soul. That's what you've not figured out. Pro-choice, as they call it, is no choice at all. And for any of those out there, wherever it may be, that take issue with me on this subject, I don't apologize for it. I will for the rest of my preaching life defend the little innocent babies because I serve the God of life. Speaking of which, aren't you thankful that when our Lord came into this world conceived by the Virgin Mary, that there was no Planned Parenthood around? Aren't you thankful that Mary would not have gone into a place like Planned Parenthood where they would have said, well, hey, you're young and unmarried. Here's what you need to do. Would it have been all right to have aborted the precious little son of God? And by the way, if one has ever had this happen, that is, if one has ever, for whatever reason, had an abortion, that too can be forgiven. I preached against abortion some years ago as a young preacher, said a lot of what I've said today. And at the end of that sermon, uh, the, it was really a question-answer session on a youth day. And then Brother David Sane, an older, more mature preacher than I, and he still is, stood to speak and he said, I want to say that I agree with everything that Barry has said. But I want to add one point. One can be forgiven even of this sin. But my friends, we could not be forgiven of this sin or any sin had groups like Planned Parenthood had their way. We have eternal life because of one who was conceived in the womb of Mary and allowed to grow and then was born and later he died for us. And every time I think about those who argue for, quote, abortion rights, I think about that one, Mary, who brought the Christ child into this world. And I'm so thankful he came into this world. In fact, his love and his mercy and his kindness is the answer to this. He came that we might have what? Life. Our God and His Son, Jesus Christ, all about life. And young people and everybody else here, you be wary of those who live on the dark side. More than ever before, there are those who are infatuated, it seems, with death. Because we're not just talking about aborting little babies. We're talking about other issues that relate to human life. Euthanasia, get to a certain age, you're disabled, can't get around like you once did. Oh, maybe it's time for that person's life to be terminated. And there are those today who talk about meaningful life and dying with dignity. But I'll tell you, you can't know anything about meaningful life or quality of life or dying with dignity until you respect the sanctity of life. And that's what this sermon is about. This morning, this particular message may not apply to your soul's condition presently. It was meant as a teaching, an instructive sermon. 
And yet I'm thankful that I can still extend the Lord's invitation so that anyone outside of Christ can come to him. And the good news is our Lord and Savior Jesus will forgive any sin if we'll bow before him in humble repentance. But don't forget, when you do become a Christian, a child of God, you become a member of the church, and that church really is the army of God. And it is to take on this old world and stand behind the banner of the cross. That's what we want to do. When you stand up against the evil of our world, you're standing up for Jesus. This morning, why not take your stand for Jesus in obeying the simple truth of the gospel, faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, what is needed to put you into Christ wherein you find salvation. If you need to come this morning, don't tarry. Come even now as we stand and sing.